So who had the most joy in that story? Was it the boy who found the 50 rubies or whatever it is he finds in the streets? As he buys something with that? I mean, think about, that's a lot of money to a kid and all the things he could have had and yet he sees a need. And he doesn't give it to her either in a way that she knew. It just appears. How much joy did he experience in that sacrifice? And how much did she experience in receiving the replacement, the exact replacement of the thing that was broken? But maybe a bigger question is, if that boy were a follower of Christ, and that was his act of worship, the sacrifice he made, how much joy did the king of the universe experience as he watched this unfold? That's really the heart of what we're going to look at today is what does it look like to really understand the great gift that you've been given and how that should impact the way we live. And so let's start with Romans 12.1. And this is our it. This is our focus right here. One verse. One verse did any go, one verse, what's involved in one verse? Well, in three hours when we're done... I think we'll understand just how much that is. But follow with me as I read along Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And it's real tempting to just jump in and and begin to unpack and say, what do all these pieces mean? What does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be pleasing? How, How am I offering my body? But there's something important that happens. You see, when we read Scripture, there's some key words that are presented to us. And the first one is, therefore. We have to stop. Anytime you read Scripture, if you read the word, therefore, you need to ask the question, what's the therefore? there for, right? Why is it there? What is happening? Because what I'm reading in this is that, therefore, there's something that was just shared, and the response that follows should be a living sacrifice. Well, what's the therefore? We have to do a quick history. We have to go back and say, Paul, in writing, writing to the Romans, he's writing to a diverse group of people. We have Jews faithfully following the Jewish laws of the Torah, the Leviticus laws, they're going through everything that they've been commanded to do. And then we also have now converted Jews who have received Jesus as the Messiah, and now they're following Jesus. And then we have Gentiles, those who aren't Jews, they're everybody else, and they're not following Jesus. And then we have Gentiles who are following Jesus. And there's a lot going on as they're trying to figure out how do we navigate following Jesus. Jesus. What does that look like? And so we have to go back. And so Paul writes some important things. So let's look at some chapters 1 through 11. And in your devotions this week, that is the challenge to go back and do some more study and to look at those one chapter at a time. But chapters 1 through 3, he lays a case. He says, listen, whether you're Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. All of humanity, all humanity is hopelessly trapped in sin. And there is no escape from that on your own. There is nothing you can do to win favor with God in a way that he would say, all right, you're my child. He says, there's nothing you can do. And so the Jews go through a series of animal sacrifices and so forth to help uh, atone for, to cover up the sin with the blood of these animals. And so they're getting some new thinking. And then he goes on to chapter 4 and he says, faith in Jesus is what is required for forgiveness, not your works. So there is nothing you can do. He makes it very clear. It's faith in Jesus. The Jewish Messiah has arrived, and it's faith in Him that will lead to forgiveness. And then in chapter 5, faith in Jesus brings eternal life. You're now free. You're free from, from death. When you come into faith in Christ, you begin a journey of eternal life. Faith in Jesus is what brings that. And so he he clearly writes this and then gets into 6 and 7 and then talks through that faith in Jesus brings freedom. Imagine growing up under the Levitical laws, all the laws that it takes, things that if you touch this, you're unclean. If you do that, you can't be in the camp. If you have this going on, all of that is removed. There's freedom. Freedom. 
No longer am I having to sacrifice animals. No, there's freedom. And it draws you to trust in Jesus and have that faith and rely on Him. And all of a sudden, things start to change. And then chapter 8, faith in Jesus brings security. Security that before there was a lamb that was brought and now the lamb arrived. Security that faith in Christ is all that is necessary, that there is no more that you have to do in the sense of all the sacrifices, all the stuff that was going on. You now have security also that you cannot be separated. When you're grafted in and adopted into the the body of Christ, that you are secure. And then 9, he sums it up again. He says, the fact is, this is critical, salvation is only by God's mercy and grace salvation. And those two words, we, they're tough. To, you can't separate them, yet they have kind of some different meaning. But the idea here that grace, being given something you don't deserve, mercy, being extended forgiveness when you didn't deserve it. The two are intertwined. And so it's only by God's mercy and grace that salvation occurs. Because we certainly didn't earn it. And through this process, what we begin to realize is that when we have faith in Christ, we are made right with God. A relationship becomes right. And you hear that word righteous. You become right with God. No longer trapped in sin. No longer destined to spend an eternity in hell separated from the Father. You now have the right relationship. Whew. And you have to let that set in. And so oftentimes as you read through Romans, I think sometimes you have to keep coming back and remind yourself, all of these things apply. So that way when you get to the therefore, you can say, that's my response. Therefore, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of everything you just read, in view of those 11 chapters, I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing right? So who are we offering it to, though? Because we can't forget it, and it lays it out clearly, but I think we have to make sure we're clear on this, that this is the God who created all, created everything, who spoke into existence, who knew you so intimately and knows you now so intimately. Scripture says that God knows the number of hairs on your head and those that some have lost. I'm losing some too. It's okay. He still loves me, right? That idea that he loves you so intimately, it says that he knew you as he knit you in your mother's womb, that he knew you before time began. That is the God who creates, who knows you. And in, in uh, 1 John there, we, or in John, sorry, one, we read, all things were made by him and through him. Who? Jesus, God in the flesh, all made by him. That's who we worship. Therefore, in response of that, that's who we worship, and secondly, that he died for us. And Romans, Romans says it very clearly. So going back to Romans chapter 5, got to back up again, keep spiraling back to the beginning, remind myself of these key, key facts that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I pursued the world, Christ died for me. While I chose to perhaps Think of the things in this life that drive my motivation that aren't God. He still died for me. While I invested my money and my time in things that weren't of the kingdom, he still died for me. While I messed in my mind of the anger and hatred that I had for people who didn't behave the way I wished they would toward me, while I perhaps wished people were dead in my own thinking, he died for me. And I'm grateful that in my life, the times that I wished people dead, perhaps, that God didn't answer that prayer, because I'm sure I've been on somebody else's list. And I'm grateful they didn't answer, he didn't answer their prayers either (laughs) in those ways, right? But see, that's who I was, wretched man, that's who I was. And God, in his complete mercy and love for me and you, died. That's who we worship. That's who. And so, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. 
you deserved death and you were granted life. Me too. I don't want to exclude myself from that statement. I don't want you to think I've done something more special. Nothing. God is the one who's done it all, and he deserves all credit. He says, in view of God's mercy. But this is what blows my mind. It says, in view of his mercy, I offer my body as a living sacrifice, and in this process, he delights in that. Like, what? What? What do you mean he delights? So, well, let's look at this, this passage, because when I read this, it just like, I can't imagine that, that God who controls all, who just basically holds everything and says, look, if I don't want something to exist, I have all right and authority to destroy. And look what it says. It says, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save, and he will take great delight in you. He quiets you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. Have you ever thought about God singing over you? That brings him to a deeper relationship that I think oftentimes we realize. Because I think a lot of times we, we do give God the, the credit he deserves to be on the throne of power. But I think we place him, and I'm very guilty of this a lot of my life, very distant from me. Like having a magnifying glass, perhaps. You know what, as a kid I used to fry ants with those things, magnifying glass. Like, I would have this picture that that's God. He's just waiting to torment me at the right time. But it says, no, when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, as you serve and pour out your life for him, when you offer your body as a living sacrifice, that he delights in that. And I thought, well, what does that look like from the human perspective? That's, this is God, and he sings over me. And so recently, I was cleaning out the garage. And uh, like most garages in Oregon, cars don't fit right? But stuff, important stuff like boats, which aren't designed to be around water, uh, those are in the shelter, right? And so, so I decided to start cleaning around the boat, and, and I'm on the desk, and I've got all these just piles of junk and paper and garbage and things that half the family keeps depositing there, and I just can't seem to get it out, and it returns, and, and I'm going through, and I'm rifling through, and then this paper, this paper emerges, and the stack of papers, I come across this one paper, Yeah, I see this paper and I realize as I'm thinking about God taking delight in me and singing over me that I'm remembering a time, a 10-year-old boy, my oldest boy, he drew this for me. And it, wasn't, uh, it was not one of those uh, holiday promoted type th things. Well, because it's Valentine's Day, because it's whatever, my son wasn't prompted by mommy to go do this. It was on his own, a non-holiday, go, go figure. And he draws this picture, and down in here you can't read it anymore, but it says, smell the heart, because the, the markers smelt. They had a little, like a nice odor, a fruit smell. And so I asked the boys, because I couldn't remember, like I don't remember receiving it. That's the horrible father in me. I probably was like, oh man, thank you son, I'm so glad. And I was probably busy doing whatever. And I said, do you remember, either of you remember who did this? And then Eli says, yeah, it was me. And, and he told me the story of when and where. And yet, so this emerges 10 years later. He's now almost 20. And I'm just, I just pause. And that idea of singing over him, taking delight in that moment, it wasn't the moment 10 years ago, but there was a delight that happened when I realized this was drawn out of love. And so my heart, in a way, sang over that moment. And I took great delight, and I thought, isn't that our Father's heart? That when we genuinely do things because we love God, when we really do things in view of His mercy, that He takes delight in that. Just like a, a human father, as I took delight over my kids. I think we have to have that picture in our mind. I think we have to get a deeper understanding of what God takes delight in. And so that I do things, not so that I'll get some pat on the back or, or a reward even, but that I do it because it's a genuine love. And I rejoice as I do that. And he delights over me. And he sings over me. It's pretty awesome. So how do we do this? If in view of God's mercy, 
We offer our bodies, it says. We're called to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, the first thing we always hear, you see, because in our culture, the word sacrifice, we don't really understand it the way the Jewish culture did. Like, it was a part of their culture. But see, when we're told to offer, the problem with living sacrifices, because some people read this and go, oh, I'm supposed to go out and die for this. The word was living. Remain living. But living sacrifices, some of you have heard this, this phrase, it's quite funny actually, that the problem with living sacrifices is they crawl off the altar. And I have to continually remind myself and replant myself back on that altar so that my life is actually being used for him. But it's so tempting to crawl off of that altar. He says, no, off your bodies as a living sacrifice. But there's something that people don't really hold on to. And that's the second piece of this, that God sees you as holy and pleasing. When you are found in Christ, when you surrender your life to Christ as your Lord and Savior, you then become seen as holy and pleasing to God. And you say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm a wretched sinner. You see, if you were doing the, the sacrifices as the Jewish person, you would go find the lamb without blemish the perfect one. You, wouldn't, you would not be acceptable for you to go find the one with the broken leg and then mange and all kinds of other problems. You say, no, that's not okay. It has to be perfect. And look at it this way. I think this is important in Colossians. If you want to write that, I don't think it's in your notes, but Colossians 1.22, it says, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free of accusation. In other words, because of what Christ did, when you trust in him, you are now seen as holy and pleasing, which gives you the ability to present yourself as that living sacrifice. And it will be pleasing if it's from your heart. This is important uh, oftentimes when you read Scripture. If you uh, are in the habit of, if you, you do some things where you take different translations, sometimes you can get confused a little bit of, well, why did they say it this way here? And, and then they're translated it different here. And, and then if you can wrestle with it and think, is that different or is that the point? And so, so as you offer your bodies, it says at the end here that this is your true and proper worship in the NIV. But also in the King James says, or reasonable service, and those sound very different. But see, this first verse, chapter 1, Paul makes it very clear. I'm going to talk to you about your bodies and what you need to do so that when you use your hands for your service, you're offering your bodies. When you speak, what you listen to, what you see, how you give, all these things are the actions that you do. And honestly, the word reasonable, in view of God's mercy, don't you think it's reasonable that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? Isn't that reasonable? If I really trust and I really understand how great the price was, shouldn't that be a reasonable service? That my service, the things I do, when done with the right heart, are proper worship. It's proper. It's pleasing. And you're seen as holy. And I think sometimes we have to stop right there and just go, wait a minute. You mean the person I was when I was against God and I come to faith in Christ, I'm now seen as holy and pleasing. That is your identity. Let go of your old identity. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you are now seen as holy and pleasing. And that begins to change your worship. It begins to change your sacrifice. I think it's super important that you pause there in your life. And every time that you think you're not worthy to do something or to receive forgiveness for something that you did, I think you have to go back and say, hold on. See, the author and creator... The Savior said, I'm seen as holy and pleasing because I've trusted in Him. Maybe I better start to trust a deeper level. But there's something really cool. I want to I give you a, a picture that when I travel, I get the privilege. God has let me go to some cool places in this world and do some amazing things and meet amazing people. 
And there's something cool that uh, you don't understand until you're in a culture where sacrifice, animal sacrifice, is still current. See, that's not necessarily a thing of the American culture. But when you travel to places where today it is still happening, where animal sacrifices are still happening, and then those people hear about this news, this good news, it changes them. And so this is a, this is a gift that was given to us uh, from the Ochum Church, the Krung people. And so this was presented to us uh, in January. The team that was over there, they gave them this, this gong. And so historically, before Christ came to the Krung people, if you heard this sound, right? This would be the scene that you would be hearing that sound in. See, this was an instrument of sacrifice. And so as they parade around this in the bondage, see that sound that you just heard in this picture is a sound of fear, of bondage. It's a sound of, if I don't do this right, if I don't mutilate this animal enough to make these spirits happy, my, my crop may suffer. And so in fear, I would dance perhaps. In fear, they dance around this animal. And the sound of the gong is the sound of bondage, not of freedom. And so people came to Christ in Cambodia, the Krung people, and many are following Jesus. The Ochum Church, of course, gives us this. And the story goes that once they came to faith and they knew that this was not proper worship, they said, get rid of them. We want to follow Jesus, get rid of them. And the missionaries who didn't want to convert them into uh, pew-sitting Christianity, but into Christ-following believers said, hold off. You see, these are gods, not Satan's. And they said, but we can't use them anymore. And they said, okay, but hold off. And some five years went by, five or six, I think, and they started to talk about it because they realized that even in this, this is part of who they are. It's part of their culture. And they wrestled with this, and it was not an easy transition, kind of like what in our old culture, culture we've experienced, like the piano in church. For those of you who know your church history, the piano was forbidden to be played in the church because that was a bar instrument. And today there are churches that still say that these drums behind me should not be played in church because of the association with worship, perhaps like the Krung. And there are those who will say the electric guitar is evil. So it's no different, but here's what's cool. Look at this picture. Look what the gongs are surrounding in this picture. You see, they came to a reality, a realization, that these gongs are not Satan's tools, but these can be instruments to help express their love for God. And I think this is my favorite picture because there's the sacrifices in the middle, but it's done. And so now when you hear it, when they play, no longer is that the sound of bondage, that's the sound of freedom. Now it's not a, a worship of improper worship, it is now used as proper worship, holy and pleasing. Isn't that a cool picture to think? They get it. Believe me, they understand when you read sacrifice, when they read and they continue to read this idea that they are to offer their bodies now as a living sacrifice, they know what sacrifice looks like. And it's still happening. And when that team was there in January, guess what? There was a sacrifice happening. To, and the signs were up. And if they entered into that village, they would be responsible for paying for that animal. Do not cross that line. This is serious business. And they would be perhaps to blame for any crop fallouts or failures or who knows what goes on. But see, what is so cool about this is that in this picture, there is no joy happening in this improper worship. But here there is joy because the worship is proper. And listen to this in Hebrews talking about Jesus. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, 
That is not the word I would write if it were me. I would say, who for the pain, I would put up with it, right? Who for the brutal nature of this, I went ahead and fell, fall, followed through. But no, this says the joy. Jesus knew that in this sacrifice, this final one, the joy was worth it. The joy was coming. And so like our video, there is joy in sacrifice when it's done correctly. There is joy. When we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, we find joy. When we don't do it to try to make God happy, when we don't do it to try to manipulate another human, when we do it out of sincere love for God, whatever that is that we do, when we sing songs from our heart in view of God's mercy, He sings over us and He delights. And there's joy in the sacrifice. Think about it this way. I want to bring it just kind of right down to practical. Any action, any action motivated by love for God is an expression of worship. And today my goal that I want to do is I want to change a word in your vocabulary. Because a lot of times we say, oh man, I was listening to some worship music. That could be very true. And it may be worshipful, but I want to stretch you a little bit. The fact is that when we sing songs like we did and we will do again, when we sing songs just for singing them, that's not worship. Just reciting the words and, and even singing without the proper heart isn't worship. That, when it's done correctly, it's called an expression of worship. When I sing in view of God's mercy, I'm expressing my worship. When I give financially to someone in need, as I pour out, I write a check and I do it with the heart that says, God, I love you so much, I want to help. That's the writing is the expression of the worship that's happening in my heart because he's worth it, right? When I go and I serve with my hands and my feet or I share the gospel with somebody or I pour my love over them by caring for them in their time of need, that is my worship if it's with the right heart. And so when we look at the scripture and it says, therefore I urge you, urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies, you will find great joy when you offer it. And the king of the universe finds great joy in your sacrifice and he takes delight in you. It's powerful. It's a powerful picture. It takes a God who's perhaps distant to some of you and hopefully brings it in a little closer to say, he wants you to love him tremendously because he loved you first. We see that in 1 John 4.19. Why do we love God? Because he first loved us. I'm going to uh, release to uh, both the campuses this morning. We have Sky and Zach down there. We love you guys. See you soon. Well, let's, let's ask this kind of personal for a minute. Let's take this to your personal heart. I'm going to ask a very simple question in view of this, right? And that is, how's your worship? You guys, worship team, come on up. Not how is your singing. Singing is good when it's worshipful. But I want to ask a deeper heart question. I'd love for you to evaluate for a minute. I'm going to bring the worship team up and we're going to sing, hopefully worshipfully, but where is it in your life that you might perhaps need some course correction? In view of God's mercy, how is your time being used? In view of God's mercy, how is your sacrifice? You know, in, that, uh, in January when the team went to Cambodia to sign a small certificate, one gentleman, oops, sorry, I get out of the way. One gentleman, uh, knowing that there was going to be a team there to do this brow commitment ceremony, this connection that we, we have, he got on a bus. He was a, works up at the Vietnamese border. He got on a bus and traveled 14 hours through the night so he could come and celebrate and support his wife and support what the church is doing. And I just asked that question, would I do that? Is, did I, will I sacrifice that time and that money that it took for him to do that? So... How's your worship? Take this week and evaluate that. And what I'm going to ask you to do is 
Um, we're going to do things a little different. Is actually, if you have those Connect cards and could hand those in, we're going to collect those now. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to think about, we're going to sing some songs. And there's some, some powerful words in these songs. There's power in these, these words. And I'd love for you to, as you sing them, to examine your heart. And if you need to stay seated, perhaps, and, and there's something that God is, is working on in you right now, something that was brought up as I kind of shared his word, and you need to, to wrestle with God a little on that in prayer, I would encourage you to do that. But otherwise, I'm going to ask you to stand. Let's stand, if you can stand with me. And we're going to sing these, and I would love for you to sing it as a heart response in view of God's mercy, to sing from your heart a response that says, God, you are so worth everything. I want, when I leave this building, I want to be a living sacrifice. I want that to be true for me. So let's sing these words together.
our praise belongs. Christ is all to your own. It's to you alone our praise belongs. Christ is all to your own. In response to his mercy, we sing these songs. All praise belongs to him. It's all his glory. His grace and mercy are so interweaved what we've received. The love he gives us, the forgiveness he gives us, we don't deserve any of it. And everything he ever gives us, we don't deserve any of it. And even the breath in our lungs, we don't deserve, but he gives it to us. So with that breath, our only response, I feel, is to just pour out our praise to him. Shout your praise. 
chance to offer your bodies, offer yourself right now. Your very heart, give it to him. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my life. you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing this is your proper worship I pray that you go out today and that your life is worship that it's not dependent upon a song that it's not out of an obligation that it's a cry of your heart let me pray for you Heavenly Father, I thank you that we could come together today to hear truth about the joy we receive when we sacrifice and the joy that you saw as you laid your life down for us. If there's anyone here today, God, who has not offered their bodies to you, I pray that today they would find freedom and find joy. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us first. In your precious name, amen. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, 
give us some feedback. We'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.